Hello, it's me again. Are you happy to see me? Because I'm happy to see you. That was really cheesy. <laughs> I can't promise it won't happen again, but just know I acknowledged that it's cheesy, so. Are we ready for another video? For another video, another glam look. It's not on yet. Don't worry, I can do better than this. One would hope. I'm not going to chat your ear off in this intro because I always do and I need to calm down just a, just a tad. So we're just going to get into it. Today's video is going to be about the front breaker. What a name. Also, it's not exactly the nicest of stories. Not that any of them ever are, but this one in particular, mm-mm. Mm -mm. it's really it's really not nice so um i'm just gonna lay this little warning out there if you get queasy easily i don't think this video is for you hun i don't think it's it's a good idea for you to continue watching but other than that if you're still down to hear all about the frat boy killer then just keep on watching this is austin harrath and Austin Harreth is the son of a dentist and a pharmacist. He lived with his younger sister and his parents in Palm Beach County in Florida. This is said to be one of the nicest, wealthiest places you can live in all of America. It's now home to over 40 billionaires. So you can... Um, I hope this sets the scene for the place we're talking about. He was living a nice life, some might say, physically anyway. But in 2010, when Austin was only 13 years old, his parents got divorced. He and his little sister stayed. I keep I keep saying little sister. She was one year younger than him. But he and his sister stayed with their mother in the family home. And the dad moved out. But he didn't move too far away from where they lived. Like, he lived locally to them. Within the same year of divorcing, both of his parents moved on. Like, <laughs> they got new partners, they got into new relationships. At first it was pretty weird for Austin and his sister because obviously all they knew was their parents being together. Now they're not and they're with other people. But it didn't take them long to adjust to this new life that they now had. It wasn't too long after this that Austin started high school and he immediately became a star student. He was top of his class being put into advanced classes. He was on the football team for the full four years that he was at the school and he even did wrestling in his sophomore year. With him being like six foot and 200 pounds, these sports were perfect for him. They were a perfect match. But one of the main things people would say about him was that he was the most laid back guy ever. It took a lot to get him worked up about something. Like his dad even referred to him as the happy boy. He really, really, really wasn't the aggressive type. So much so that people had to rile him up before he would go and play football so that he would come off somewhat aggressive towards the other team. When Austin would think about his future, he would always say that he wanted to have a career that would help him help as many people as he could. So when he graduated high school in 2015 and received a letter from Florida State University saying that he had been accepted onto their pre-med program. That was a mouthful. Pre-med program. Oh, you can imagine just how happy he was because obviously being in medical allowed him to help numerous amounts of people. He then spent his entire summer celebrating and making memories with his family and friends before heading off to college. His family went with him and moved him into his dorm and like, you know, made sure he was fine and then said their goodbyes and left. This must have been like such a proud moment for his family because he was studying pre-med at Florida State University. Seemingly had his life together. I mean, yeah, on the outside, Austin was thriving. He was doing insanely well, but on the inside, he was struggling a lot mentally. But he didn't tell anyone. Instead, he started drinking, smoking, taking drugs, smoke things like marijuana, take Vivance. Vivance is a drug that helps people with ADHD. And he would occasionally do things like mushrooms, acid, and MDMA. The reason why Austin felt so low was because he felt like people didn't like him as much because he was so shy and awkward, which as you can imagine made him very anxious and depressed. Now, 
Fast forward to the final month of school and he seemed to have spiralled because his search history, mm, he was searching things like, I think I'm crazy, what do I do? How do you know if you're crazy? Do I need sleep? What happens if I don't? And when he returned home after school had finished, his family could tell that there was something off immediately. Probably something to do with the fact that within a few days of being home, Austin moved his bed from his bedroom into the garage because he was convinced that there were demons in the house, like the house was just filled with them. This caused him to not sleep at night and to actually patrol the house, knocking on each of his family members doors every two hours and announcing that he was guarding them from the demons. Because of this, his family started to lock their doors at night to, you know, stop him from going in there, clearly starting to fear him just a little bit or just think that, you know, this is really bizarre. I'm just gonna put a little barrier here. You're freaking me out. I don't want you coming into my comfort zone while I'm passed out. Understandable. I'd do the same if one of my sisters started acting that way. <laughs> After a while of this happening, like every night, his family figured that he had to be on drugs because this was so unusual, especially for him, like so out of character. And when they confronted him about it, he just straight up admitted, like, yeah, I'm on drugs and then listed every drug that he was on. So his family did nothing else but put all of their energy and time into getting him the help that he needed. Now, after them helping him for quite a while, he was very adamant that he wasn't taking anything anymore, but he was still acting very, very strange. This led the family to wanting to try out the Baker Act. This is the Florida Mental Health Act of 1971, which allows involuntary institutionalization and examination. That was a long word. Do you hear me struggling? But before they could introduce this into the situation, on August 15th, one of Austin's friends said that Austin just randomly turned up at his house with no like prior arrangements, which was Again, very out of character for him because he was he was always the type to just like shoot a text or something like that to say, I'm coming round or something like that. So shows up at his friend's house unannounced, doesn't say hello or how are you or anything like that, just bluntly says, what year was I born? And then Austin walked away without saying a single word after that. The only thing he said to his friend was, what year was I born? Now, his friend can't stop thinking about what just happened. So he calls Austin and says, hey, why don't you come back and we just hang out for the day? Obviously concerned about Austin because that was so strange and out of character. Austin agrees and goes back and they actually end up meeting up with some of their other friends and also Austin's little sister. They all agree that the beach would be a fun destination to spend their day. So they all make their way over when Austin says, hey guys, I gotta go get something from my house. So I'll just meet you all there. His friends don't really think anything of it and just say, okay, see you there. But when he returned, he had completely changed his outfit. He was now wearing a thick football jersey, sweatpants, two watches. Oh, and some sunglasses, you know, been at the beach. The fact that he was going to the beach made his outfit so random. It was not only the beach, but he was in Florida in the middle of August. You know, it, it being hot and all that. Naturally, friends being friends started to rip into him a little bit about his outfit choice, but Austin didn't find this funny in the slightest and actually lashed out at them saying, if you tell me I'm crazy, I'll kill you. His friends backed off pretty quickly because, I mean, they didn't mean any harm by it. They were just giving him a hard time and they weren't expecting that sort of outcome because again, out of character. Now, his little sister goes over to him to, you know, try and calm him down, sort out the situation a little bit, but apparently he just like snapped out of it and was acting as if he hadn't just yelled at everybody 0.2 seconds ago. But this didn't mean he was back to normal because he turned to his sister and said, I'm actually half horse and I'm immortal. But you're not though, but that's okay, that's okay. It's 2024, it wasn't at the time, but it's 2024, be what you want. Immortal though? 
His sister, obviously being very concerned, just straight up said to him, you need to get help. Like, just go see a therapist or something because this isn't normal. You're not acting normal. Austin actually responded quite well to this and agreed that he needed to get help, that there was something wrong and he wasn't normal. He and his sister pushed this conversation to one side because they wanted to spend the day at the beach with their friends and just have fun. So that's exactly what they did and Austin was being normal for the rest of the day. It got to the evening and Austin, his sister, and the friend that Austin went to his house at the start of the day, that friend, they all decided that they were gonna go get some food at a restaurant in town called Duffy's. So they tell the group that they're gonna leave and go get some food, say their goodbyes, and off they go. Austin had been acting normal since his outburst, so everything was just going smoothly until Austin turned to his sister and said, I need to test my immortality. And then with no hesitation whatsoever, he just turns towards the road and walks into the traffic. Luckily, his sister was able to grab him and pull him back onto the pavement. Sidewalk? Should I say sidewalk because it's an American story? Sidewalk, we'll, st we'll stick with sidewalk. So yeah, his sister grabs him, pulls him onto the sidewalk because she was quick enough and she did not let go of him until they got to the restaurant, like literally pushing him to the restaurant. Now they were all going to the restaurant to meet up with Austin's dad and the dad's new girlfriend. So they all meet up, they go inside, they get seated at a booth at the back of the restaurant. It only lasts about three minutes of them all sitting down together before Austin gets up and looks like he's heading towards the bathroom, but at the last second turns towards the entrance and just walks straight out the front door. He's only out there for like a minute and then comes back in and sits back down. And then another 10 minutes or so goes by of them all just sitting together, chin wagging. And then Austin gets up again, but this time doesn't even make it seem as though he's going to the bathroom. He just walks straight out the front door and he doesn't come back in this time. Like he, he's gone. His mother who was at home heard the front door go so obviously went to go see what it was. And when she got to the kitchen, she saw Austin stood there chugging a bottle of vegetable oil. Obviously his mother thinks this is the weirdest situation ever. So just goes over and like grabs the bottle off him and just tells him to stop because you know, it's weird. He listens immediately and goes upstairs to change his outfit. Don't know why maybe he got oil all over himself, wouldn't be the most unusual part of the situation. After he changed, his mother drove him back to the restaurant and watched him walk into the restaurant to make sure he actually went inside. Now, at this point, it had been about 30 minutes since he got up from the table. So this must have been such a weird situation for everybody at the table because not only has it been 30 minutes, but he's walking back in with a completely new outfit on. Like he's not wearing the, the jersey and the sweatpants. He's wearing shorts, t-shirt and a baseball hat. So it looks like it's, it's a calm situation for a little bit when he sits down, but all of a sudden you see his dad say something to him and Austin not take it so well because Austin gets up, pushes his dad's head and like holds him against the seat. Eventually he does let go and he just gets up and storms off. This time though, his friend running after him, but he wasn't quick enough because when he got outside, he couldn't see where Austin had gone. Like he, he was nowhere to be seen. So because he can't see where Austin went, the friend walks back inside and tells everyone at the table that he couldn't find him, which led the dad's girlfriend to calling the police and reporting Austin missing. Obviously in a normal situation, that'd be jumping the gun a little bit, like calling the police and be like, hey, they're missing, they were with me two minutes ago, but now they're not. Normal situation, jumping the gun. But this, obviously they were concerned that he would not only be a threat to himself, but to everyone else, because obviously they don't know what is going on with him right now. Okay, sorry, I had to finish my eyes off camera because I was getting so stressed, but I was trying to stay calm. <laughs> Don't know if the stress or the calmness came across, but your girl was going through it. So I just finished him off camera and now we can carry on with the story, hopefully stress-free. This is the part of the story where I introduce you to three very important people in this story. Michelle Mishkan, John Stevens, and Jeff Fisher. 
These people lived in a town only four miles away from the restaurant that Austin and his family were dining at. Michelle, a 53-year-old woman, was sitting in her garage watching TV, and her husband, John, who was 59 at the time, was out walking their dog. Just a little bit of a backstory about these people before we carry on. Michelle and John had been together for 20 years, and they had three children together. Everyone would say that they were just such a nice, happy couple and that they were very inviting. Like they'd sit with their garage open while they were watching TV. Like they used their garage as their like living room area just to say hi to people as they pass by. Like that's just, that's the cutest thing ever. Michelle had recently retired from her financial advisory job and John had also recently retired from his landscaping company he owned. Everybody in the town loved them, but particularly their neighbour opposite, Jeff Fisher, who would often go round and actually hang out with them in their garage. So now that I've introduced you to our three new people, let's get back into the story. On this particular night, Jeff had decided that he wanted to go to bed early. You know, catch an early night. So that's what he did, that's what he prepared for. He got into bed and was trying to doze off when he started hearing these weird noises coming from outside. So obviously being curious, he like listened closer. When all of a sudden, he just heard this really loud, like a horror scream coming from the other side of the road. So immediately he gets up, makes his way outside and onto the street. And from where he was standing, he could see a young man that he'd never seen before in his life slamming Michelle's car door. The young man then turns towards the garage and starts walking further up the driveway towards Michelle, who is very noticeably terrified. This young man was Austin Harris. He'd somehow made his way four miles away from the restaurant and onto this woman's driveway. Jeff had absolutely no idea what was going on, so he ran over to see if everything was okay. But things got worse very quickly. As Jeff was running over, he sees Austin grab Michelle and throw her onto the floor, and then get on top of her and start beating her. Eventually, when Jeff gets to them, Austin turns around and said, You want no part of this. You want no part of me. But Jeff didn't back away. I mean, he was there to help Michelle, so... That's what he was going to try and do. He lunged himself at Austin, but Austin actually managed to swing at him and actually hit him on the side of the head. Now, Jeff was a pretty big dude, so he didn't really acknowledge the hit at first. Instead, he grabbed Austin and threw him to the floor, making Austin hit the ground face first. I know Austin's the bad guy here, but ouch. As Jeff was assessing the situation real quick, he notices this very horrible pain suddenly take over his entire body. So when he looks down, he sees himself covered in blood. What he didn't know was that Austin was carrying a knife. So when Austin hit Jeff on the side of the head, he actually cut him with a knife. Not just on the head either, but in five different places. One of those punctures being in the neck. Now having these wounds and seeing all of that blood it is no doubt a very worrying situation for someone to be in because you have no idea how severe those punctures could be. After noticing the state he was in, Jeff realises he can't keep fighting Austin. So when he sees Austin get up and go back at him with the knife, he just runs into Michelle's house. Now in his mind, he thought that this would make Austin chase after him, giving Michelle more of a chance, but he didn't actually check to see if Austin was running behind him. So we don't know if he was or not. Now, once he reaches the back door, he runs out of the house and makes a beeline for his own house. Still not sure whether Austin is actually following him. Once he gets to his house, he goes inside, locks the door. Clever thinking and then immediately calls the police. This is how that phone call went. Young man beating up a woman across the street. Okay, are they outside or in a house? It's in a garage. There's a girl laying on the ground. He beat her up. I ran over there. I'm bleeding profusely here at the moment. I don't know what happened. Can you tell stabbed. if she's conscious or is she unconscious? No, it does not appear so, no. 
Okay, and how? what kind of injuries do you have? Oh, I've been stabbed in the back. You know how old he is? About 25 years old. And what was he wearing? Um, shorts and a t-shirt. Do you know who he is? I have no idea. Now, after that 911 call, Jeff stayed in his house, but was constantly worrying about whether or not Michelle was okay. But after a little while, he begins to hear like this really loud grunting and then someone literally screaming for their life. It was around this time that the police turned up. Now, the first responding officer is running towards the house with a gun in her hand. And the second responding officer is at the bottom of the driveway making his way up when he sees like a massive puddle of blood. He said it had to have been at least six feet wide, just running down the driveway. After clocking the blood, he looks up and sees the first officer standing in front of the car, like where the bonnet is, like standing in front of it, with her gun pointed towards the ground, saying nothing. So obviously he runs over there to see what she's pointing her gun at, and sees a man laying on the floor, very, like, stiff, just not saying anything, just staring at them, until eventually he speaks and says, please help me. This man was John Stevens. And the reason why he was asking for help from the officers, he was being held down by Austin. Austin was on top of him, holding him in place with one hand while his other hand was doing something to John's face. The officers couldn't make out what was actually going on, but what they did know was that something was very wrong and that it needed to stop right now. But the first officer that had her gun pointed at the situation couldn't actually shoot Austin because there was this massive risk of the bullet going straight through Austin and into John, killing John. So the second officer said, I'll tase him. So he moves around so that he has a clear shot of Austin's back. But in doing so, he ended up getting a much better view of what was actually happening. The hand that Austin was using to do something to John's face was actually pulling John's face out, like his full cheek, enough for Austin to bite the inside of his cheek, chew it, and swallow it. See, I told you this story was a lot. Feel free to click off now if this is getting too much, or just like fast forward a little bit if you just want to see how this ends, because I understand that this is, it's a lot, it's a lot. We're gonna be upfront, we're gonna be honest, it's a lot. After seeing what he saw, it was now very obvious to the officers that there was already a lot of chunks missing from John's face. The second officer then shoots his taser into Austin's back, but it did absolutely nothing. Like he didn't even budge or at least yelp like any normal person would if they're being tased. Because the taser has done absolutely nothing, the second officer walks around, so now he has a clear view of Austin's face and just straight up kicks him square in the face. This obviously moves Austin back a little bit. Like, he's not stone, he's not staying there this time. It moves him back a little bit. And you would think that this would make Austin lash out a bit, like start a fight with the officers but it doesn't. He doesn't even like acknowledge that they're there. He just, as soon as he moves back, he just goes straight back on, gets a tighter grip on John and then just bites at his face. So again, the officer kicks him in the face. It sends Austin back a bit, but then the same thing happens again. Austin just gets a tighter grip again and carries on doing what he was doing. So this just kept happening to the point where the officer just kept kicking him and kicking him and kicking him over and over again hoping it would do something. Eventually, more officers showed up at the scene, and this time, they brought a dog with them. And immediately, the officers that were already on the scene shouted over, saying, release the dog. So obviously, they do, and the dog comes running up the driveway and immediately latches on to Austin's arm, like the one that's being used to, like, pull John's face. That arm. The dog starts, like, dragging the arm back as it's been trained to do. But just like everything else, this does not phase Austin. And he just pulls his arm back pretty forcefully, actually causing a lot of damage to his arm and just went back 
again to do what he was already doing. So just like the officer did, the dog went back, latched on again and kept pulling the arm. But Austin once again pulled his arm back, causing even more damage to his arm. Like we're talking, like it's not just a graze, like the dog's teeth were in there. Things were happening to the arm. I'm not gonna lie, it's graphic, but so is everything else in this story. So on the third attempt, that when the dog like grabs onto the arm and starts pulling back and it kind of like moves Austin just a little bit, the police officer kicks him in the face once again. And because of the force of both of them pulling him back, Austin like completely falls off of John. Immediately the second officer like leaps over John and onto Austin, actually landing on Austin's head, which obviously then like spun him out just a tiny little bit, you know, having a human land on your head. Now there's more of like a, a scrapple because the officer's trying to get a handcuff onto Austin, but he does actually manage to get one on. And when he does, he gets up and like pulls Austin up the driveway further to get him away from John. Now another little fight happens because the officer's now trying to get the second handcuff onto Austin. The struggle lasts for a little while with Austin and the officer like shouting back and forth to each other. But then Austin shouts something that kind of sends shivers down your spine a little bit. He shouts out, I'm eating humans, kill me. But I mean, he's not wrong. At this point, Austin was fighting back so much that all of the officers at the scene had to restrain him just so they can get this second handcuff on. Obviously, eventually in the end, they, they did manage to get the handcuff on. And that was then the point where they all went and checked on the victims. Sadly, both Michelle and John died at the scene due to the traumas that they had induced. Jeff, the neighbor, went on to make a full recovery, by the way. Happy for Jeff. But whilst laying on the ground, like fully restrained in handcuffs, Austin became unresponsive. He was rushed to the hospital and actually ended up going into a coma for 11 days. They found out that he'd actually consumed a very poisonous chemical that was causing his organs to fail and shut down. But after the 11 days, he did wake up and make a full recovery. The family of the victims were actually praying that Austin would wake up and make a full recovery. They wanted him to be fully present and aware. Fitting. They wanted him to be fully present and aware when he was being given his sentence, which they were hoping was gonna be the death penalty. After waking up from his coma, but before being transferred to jail, Austin did an interview about the situation with none other than Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil being a clinical psychologist, but also a TV personality. In that interview, all Austin did was cry and break down about how sorry he was for what he did and begged the family of the victims for their forgiveness. Little did he know that the family were actually wishing death on him. So I don't think he's gonna be forgiven anytime soon. It was agreed that Austin must have been on some kind of hard substance when committing the crimes. The drug that they thought he would have been on was a drug called Flacca. It's a synthetic hallucinogenic drug known to cause users to get pretty violent and lash out. However, Austin's toxicology report showed that he only had a very small amount of THC in his system, which is found in marijuana. Obviously that then had people scratching their heads like what made him turn and want to do that like going from a day at the beach to then killing two innocent strangers in a very very brutal way when talking to austin about the situation they asked him why he did what he did and all he could say at first was i don't remember but eventually he did reveal more details now this story that he told it's not exactly a story that you would expect, but after everything that we've already been through here, it's not too hard to believe that this is where his mind was at. He said that when he left the restaurant after arguing with his dad, he saw a dark figure stood in front of him with a white face and he immediately knew that this dark figure was evil. 
So he started running as fast as he could for as long as he could to get away from whatever that was and actually ended up four miles away in a town that he he'd never been to before. He said that he stopped running when he saw a lit up garage on the street because he assumed that there would be people in there that could help him with this whole evil entity thing. So he runs up the driveway to, you know, get help and that's when he sees Michelle. He approached Michelle and she just screamed. Obviously, like him saying what he's saying and probably being in a very weird state, going up to a stranger in her own home, startling her, that that whole situation, I understand why she screamed. Austin said that because she screamed, it made him believe that she was a witch. So he decided to attack her with his knife. After doing so, he said that he got up and started drinking some alcohol that he found lying around, which we now know was poisonous chemicals. He then turned to the street and saw another dark figure stood there with a dog. And then after that, he said he just completely blacked out. He does not remember a single thing. It's now believed that the the figure that he was describing with the dog was actually John coming back from his walk with his dog. Austin's story clearly has gaps in it. Like he failed to mention his encounter with the neighbor, Jeff, completely. But Austin said that he cannot recall the entire interaction with Jeff and he can't even remember the police turning up. Like he has no memory of that whole situation with the police. He said that the only thing he remembers after seeing the figure with the dog was waking up 11 days later. The public didn't believe this story one bit. They saw this as Austin's way of making himself seem crazy so that he could plead insanity at trial. But forensic psychologist Philip Resnick, who was known to be very, very, very good at what he did, actually did an assessment on Austin. Can you hear my dog snoring? In the 38 page report that Philip Resnick did on Austin, he goes into a lot of details, proving that Austin was in a psychotic state when he was committing those crimes. The name of this type of episode is Clinical Lycanthropy Delusions which is a mental state where someone believes that they are no longer human and actually are something more like a werewolf, which would explain a lot. <laughs> you know, the animalistic sounds that Jeff could hear and the eating of another human. One major thing here was that Austin had no survival instincts. You know, usually when somebody's being hit, kicked, even bitten by a dog, they tend to have some sort of a reaction, but Austin can't even remember it happening in the first place. Now, after hearing the entire story and knowing that Austin wasn't in his right mind, everything just kind of starts to piece together. Like him telling his friends that he was half human, half another animal, and claiming that he was immortal. He was talking about being immortal, running light, being in front of cars, testing his powers, being a half an animal. And actively telling people that he wasn't okay and agreeing when they said that he needed help. All the signs were there, it's just how does somebody go from being a star student on the football team, going to Florida State University to study pre-med, wanting to help so many people like in his life, like that was his career choice. Being a very laid back, cool, chilled out guy that people had to actually rile up if they wanted some sort of reaction to this in such a small portion of his life. His entire life he was this, he was everything that I just described. And then between going away to school and coming back home, something happened, something went wrong. Also, just so you know, Austin is still in jail right now, awaiting trial. Testing his powers, being a half an animal. Wow, is all I can say after that story.
I wasn't lying when I said it was it's a crazy one. Makeup Sam, by the way. <laughs> Went for a little diamante look, all rhinestones. Anyways, I promise they won't all be this graphic, but all the ones that are this graphic, I will let you know beforehand. This was too much, I'm really sorry. I did try and warn you. If you did enjoy, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on the little notification bell. I mean, you don't want to miss any more of these uploads. It's a fun time, I promise. Hope you're having a lovely day, evening, night time, early morning start. Whenever you're watching this, I hope you're having a swell time and I hope you come and join me in the next one. Goodbye.